Good morning. Uh, I'll ask you the same question I asked the first service. Where have you been? We've been here. Where have you been? It's so good to see you. It is so very, very good to see you. And uh, praise the Lord uh, for us having the privilege of being back together. I just want to publicly say uh, a couple of thank yous. Um, uh, thank you so much to the volunteers during this two and a half month time. Uh, there's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Uh, and we're very grateful for the folks who uh, did all of that volunteer work to make sure we, we were on the air and make sure we had to change a lot of things. And to do that, they invested a lot of uh, time in doing that, and we're very, very grateful. I'm thankful for the staff uh, who have worked very hard uh, during these two and a half months uh, and uh, very grateful for their creativity and thoughtfulness. Um, grateful for people doing things. Uh, uh, we had somebody buy and contribute all the hand sanitizer. We couldn't find them. We, we were searching. We found them, but they said they'd ship them to us around January. Uh, somebody in the church uh, kept digging, and he found them and bought them and got them here to us, and we're very grateful for him. Uh, as you leave, the offering boxes... Uh, we're not passing offering place today. A man in the church, Fred Strebeck, made those for us. I just got them done this week. And so there's been all this effort. Uh, the people that show up, all the chairs have been cleaned from the first service uh, so you could sit in them without fear. And so I'm so grateful for that. As we enter into the worship service this morning, uh, there are going to be a couple of things. One is there's going to be a little bit of, uh, there is going to be lament. And by that, an expression of grief, grief over the loss that COVID has brought. Uh, some people have lost their jobs. Uh, certainly all of us experienced some limitation on where we could go and what we could do. Uh, some people lost family members, none that I know of in our own church, but certainly uh, we can join with others in grieving, uh, weep with those who weep. Uh, certainly we grieve over the circumstances of our country now and wonder, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to say? How are we supposed to respond? Questions we're asking ourselves. And so there will be that sense of lament, but there's also going to be this sense of rejoicing and thankful for God's faithfulness and thankful for God's presence and thankful for God's people, all those things. So both of those things will be elements of our worship service. Not a better way for us to begin this morning, however, than by an expression of thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. You're familiar with it. Stand with me. We're going to sing a cappella. Rick's going to lead us. If you don't know Rick, he's playing the bass. Uh, Rick's going to lead us in singing the doxology as we get back together and begin to worship. And here's where we're going to start. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Wonderful. You may be seated. Again, we are so happy to be able to be together and worship this morning. Over the course of the past month or so, at the direction of the elders, we had a task force that has been working on making some decisions and recommendations and thinking about what things would look like for us once we were able to gather here again. Uh, we're grateful for that group, and that will continue to happen as we move forward. But we want you to know, please reach out if you have any questions about what's going on. Uh, things look different no doubt, and things will continue to look different for a little while, but uh, we want you to, to be uh, feeling free to reach out with any questions that you may have about things that are going on. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we will have some different things happening. We're not going to be passing an offering plate or anything like that, so as you may see, we've got two boxes in the back corner for our offering. Uh, we'd ask that you come in through the middle doors and then out through the corner doors, and you can drop off an offering if you'd like on your way out. 
And please also know that the mother's room is still available just out these back doors if you need it. Um, and also, please know that uh, throughout this time, uh, we want to thank you for your faithful giving over the course of the past three months. Um, it's been a, a real testament to God's provision for us. And please know that all of our online giving options are available at this time still as well. Now, in part, due to some of the changes uh, going around and also... Uh, in part, uh, just something that we've needed for a while is that we still need help with our sound and AV team. So if you have uh, any uh, recommendations for us, or if you're interested in serving on our AV team, which helps with our sound and our camera, our slides up here, all of the above, uh, please reach out. Let me know, and I will be sure to connect you with uh, the people who can help you learn how to do that and, and get connected. We could really use your help in that way. Now, if you would, please pray with me as we uh, cry out to God, who is our help in all things. Almighty God, we cry out to you this morning. We bring all sorts of emotions before you today. Relief and happiness and joy that we can worship together again. But we also feel lament and impatience and frustration. We're reminded of the brokenness in our world as we see injustice and unrest around us. And these have been trying times, and we struggle to see at times what we should do or how we can move forward. But in all these things, we wait for you. Our souls wait for you, and in your word we hope. As your word says, our souls wait for you more than those who watch for the morning. And our hope is in you today, God, for it is you who redeems us from all our sins. It is you who gathers us here this morning, and it is you who will continue to provide for us in all that we face. We bring these things before you in Christ's name. Amen.
sing give us clean hands so often as we lament we we also repent and this is an essential part of our walk so join with us now and sing corporately with us the song of of the already but not yet. Jesus has come. He has died. He has redeemed us. He has fought for us. But his kingdom isn't here yet. Um, and we see that very, very clearly, uh, that we still live in a fallen world and a broken world that desperately longs for the return of his kingdom. Um, and that, that, that means that there is still joy to celebrate, right? We have lamenting, and we have pain, and we have sorrow at the hands of a fallen world, but we have joy in the hope and promise of a coming kingdom delivered by our Lord and our Savior. This is, the, this is so much of the essence of, of our faith, of our hope. And, and Psalms uh, 31 through 5 really, really sit in the middle of that essence. If you have Bibles and you want to turn with us, uh, it'll also be on the screen. We're going to go through this passage. I extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, 
and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So now as we transition from, from, from lament and from pain, the, the goal is not to run from it. The goal is not to hide from it, to, to run away from the uncomfortable feelings of that lament and that pain. We actually need to stay in that. But, it, but we know we have that hope. And we're here together for the first time in months, right? And that's something to celebrate. So we're going we're gonna to get into that. Yes, yes. Um, so we're going we're gonna to celebrate. We're, we're, we're going to celebrate being here together as a community corporately. Um, but not forgetting the lament that, we, that we've taken part in and will continue to take part in. So, Join with us as we celebrate uh, in singing of our rescuer. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. And know how sweet the sound. Oh, how great the bound. The good Lord has come to see me and say, Cause he's our rescuer, he's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Know how sweet the sound, oh how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord our rescuer. He's beautiful. Riches for the poor, he is friendship for the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary, the rest for those who strive. For the good Lord, for the way, the truth, the light. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the light. Cause he's our rescuer. to publicly say thank you uh, so grateful for Caleb uh, 
Caleb is uh, the fellow who is leading us. Um, Caleb, you know, home from college, he goes to SIU. He's an intervarsity leader uh, there on campus, grew up in this church, uh, and he showed up at the right time to help us uh, after our dear brother Joseph uh, took a church over in Indiana. And uh, so I'm very grateful for Caleb uh, and his continued work with us. Be in prayer. Uh, the elders have interviewed one person so far for the uh, worship leader position, uh, and we have another interview tomorrow evening. So uh, we are seeking, and I trust that you are praying uh, as we continue to seek the Lord's will and person uh, for that particular position. But Again, I'm very, very grateful for Caleb. If you don't know Caleb, get to know him. Uh, he is a young man with an amazing heart. Um, in the late 60s, I was um, 10, 11, 12 in the uh, 67, 68, 69. Uh, and it was such a t turbulent time. If you're old enough to have lived through it and to remember uh, for example, the year 1968, what, what an, uh, an amazing year it was. There was a war taking place uh, in a country that most of us had heard so little about, Vietnam, and we were sending young men over there. The Tet Offensive happened in 1968. It was a terrible uh, thing. Um, there was uh, an event that took place just north of us, 120 miles in Chicago, the Democratic Convention, and all of the unrest that surrounded that, and, and Mayor Daley, and the actions uh, he took, it, it, was, it was an amazing thing to see. Martin Luther King was assassinated, standing on a balcony of a hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was in California, speaking to a crowded room full of people, and, and a lot of people thought that he represented hope in that turbulent time, and he was also assassinated. Um, there were some bright spots. The Boeing Company introduced the 747, one of the most amazing uh, passenger jets to have ever, um, to ever have flown. I hope you've had the privilege of, they're phasing them out, they're using a lot for cargo now, but I hope you've had the opportunity to fly on one. Absolutely amazing airplane. In, in December of 68 was when Apollo 8 circled the moon. They weren't ready, they weren't ready, but they launched it because they were trying to speed things up. And three very brave men stepped into a capsule and took enormous personal risk uh, to fly and circle the moon. In 1968, I had a brother, he was 16 at the time, and, and he saw things quite differently than I did, and he saw things a lot differently than my parents did. And he told me, he said, Paul, conformity is a bad thing. Don't conform. Rebel. Well, I, I'm a 10-year-old kid. I, you know, what, what, what does that mean? I, I don't know. But there was an event at my school, and... I was uh, asked, along with my whole class, to, to dress up uh, and come wearing costume. I don't even remember what the event was. And so the night before the event, this is what you do to your parents. The night before the event, I tell my mom, I need a costume. Oh, by the way, I need a costume. My mom was a nurse and worked 3 to 11 my whole life, and so... I'm sure the way it happened is I often left her notes. When she got home, she saw the note. They allowed me. I, I can't believe my mom and dad. My dad was fought in World War II, and then he joined the Air Force, military man his whole life, spit and polish, short hair, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Uh, they agreed to allow me to dress up as a hippie. I had a tie-dye shirt on and a leather vest and jeans. 
I wore boots. Sandals were not allowed in my home growing up, but I had a pair of boots on and the jeans and the tie-dye shirt and the, and the vest. And my mom looked around and took her mop head off of the handle and flipped it over and put it on my head. And so this mop head hung down. I don't know if she was mocking or if she was helping. I don't know. And then found a fedora to cover the top of the mop head and my dad actually made me a poster sign and he put a peace symbol on it I just I I couldn't believe it and and so I went to this school event as a hippie don't conform rebel but when I read in the scripture when I read the apostle Paul and what he says he says don't rebel conform in fact Paul would say God's will God's purpose if you're if you're wondering, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to be as a Christian? We wonder that. How does, how does what it means to be a Christian display itself during COVID-19? What does it mean to look like Jesus during this very turbulent time? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? How am I supposed to act? What am I supposed to post? Paul says conform uh, to discover God's will, to discover God's purpose, to discover God's plan, to discover God's intent, to discover even what God is intentionally, purposefully doing in your life, Paul would say to us, then understand what it means to conform, because Paul would say to us that conformity is a good thing. Indeed, Paul would say to us that conformity is is a God thing. During these days of COVID-19, a lot of us have clung to the hope of Romans chapter number 8. It's a familiar verse that we go to when things are fractured and broken around us. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We, we read that verse and we say, oh God, may those things be true even in the midst of this pandemic, even in the midst of this turbulent time in our nation. But maybe we're not as familiar with the next verse. Let me read it to you where Paul goes on to the, say, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined, God plan, God purpose, God desired, God intentionally is working toward those people who long for these things to work for good. Paul said, God is working those things for good, and God is working to conform them into the likeness, into the image of his son. That's what he said in Romans 8, 29, in order that he might be the firstborn among many Brothers, It is the intent, it is the purpose of God to conform us. Conformity is a good thing, and his purpose in that conformity is to conform us into the likeness, the image of his son. We know that doesn't mean to look like Jesus. I don't know, are the artists right? Are the paintings that people render of Jesus right? I don't know, maybe. Maybe he wasn't quite as handsome, maybe he was. Maybe he was... I, I don't know. I don't know what he looked like. You don't know either. We know he was Jewish. We know he was olive-skinned, dark-haired, probably brown-eyed. Uh, we can't go. He was a man. He probably fit the common style of his day. He bore a beard. He did. The Bible does tell us that. But when Paul and the Scripture talks about being conformed, we know that God isn't about making us Jewish in the way that we look. What is he telling us? What is he saying to us? What does Paul mean when he says, we with unveiled faces, we know what it means to wear a veil. Are you, are you, are you, have you been a, have you been a good boy and girl? Have you worn in your veil? <laughs> Some of you are rebels. Some of you would be like my brother and say to me, it's not about conformity, it's about rebellion. I've seen you in big R. You didn't have your mask on. <laughs> we know what it means to wear the veil. Well, what in the world is Paul talking about having a veil, being unveiled? He's talking about Moses. 
You remember Moses was up on the mountain, and what did Moses see up on the mountain? The very what? What did he see? The glory of God. And what did it do? It changed his appearance. It reflected in his face. And as that glory began to fade, Moses wore a mask, but people could not enter into the temple when God's glory came into the temple. It was so overwhelming, so powerful. They couldn't touch the mountain. They couldn't come up to the mountain. The glory uh, was so overwhelming at the transfiguration of Jesus. It was so overwhelming, so powerful. The veil, though, has been removed, and now we see his glory. The scripture says we see his glory. How do we see his glory? The glory of the only begotten of the you got to help me. I'm, you got to help me. You've been gone for three months. I've been up here preaching by myself. Even if it's wrong, say something. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so when he talks about beholding the glory with unveiled faces, he's talking about seeing the glory of Jesus himself. And how do we see that glory, Paul says? We don't see it literally. We see it in the reality of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And Paul says, in seeing that glory, he goes on to write in 2 Corinthians 3, we are being transformed into that same image, one degree of glory to another. We are being transformed more and more as we understand more and more of who Jesus is and what Jesus is like. We are more and more being transformed into who Jesus is and what Jesus is like. There are a couple of words, they're made up words. Uh, Michael Gorman is an author and he made up this word. It's not a real word, but I guess it's a real word. He made up the word cruciformity. And what he means by that is we are impacted, transformed, changed by the cross of Christ. We would quote, for example, Galatians chapter number 2, verse 20. For I am crucified with Christ. For I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so we would say the cross of Christ is a transformative power in our life. It shapes our life. It shapes our service. It shapes my selflessness as a husband. I serve my wife in ways that I may not want to because I seek to die to myself and become alive to Christ. And so I display that by the very way that I respond as an example to my wife or to my children or to my parents. All of those things, it's transformative. Well, Scott McKnight is also an author, and he took off on this word, and he calls it Christiformity. By that, he means, I like the word, he means to be conformed to Christ, to be formed by the life of Jesus, by the death of Jesus, by the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. We're not only to believe the gospel, but we are to embody the gospel. That's in a book called Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul, about Paul the Apostle, Scott McKnight. Paul writes, for example, in Ephesians 5, walk in love, walk in love, Ephesians 5. How? Even as Christ loved us. How are we to love one another? How are we to love people? Even as Christ loved us. Another way, for example, in Colossians, he says we're to be a forgiver. Well, how are we to be a forgiver? We're to forgive even as we have been forgiven. As Christ forgives us, all of our sins, all of our sins, as Christ in grace forgives us, we are in, uh, uh, turned to reflect that likeness and forgive others. They'll know your disciples by your love. And so there's this transformity, this conformity, this Christiformity as we become more and more like Christ. There is a truth in which that is true in a physical sense because of the resurrection. He's the first fruits, the first fruits of all those that are going to follow. Jesus rose from the dead. We also shall physically be resurrected in body, in body. You're not going to get simply get rid. The Gnostics were wrong. The body is not sinful. The body is not sinful. Does sin come uh, on display through the body? Sure it does. Sure it does. But your tongue doesn't talk. You talk with your tongue. Your eyes do not lust. You lust with your eyes. 
And so this body is going to be resurrected, like Jesus was resurrected, that it is a great and glorious hope. And as Caleb talked about in the coming, ultimate coming of the kingdom and all the realities of those things. But it's also true that we are going to be shaped more and more into the likeness of Christ in his moral character, in his person, in the essence of who he is. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he truly is. And I cannot wait until that glorious day, because I weary of sin. Do you not get weary of your sin? I get weary of my own sin. I told the first service, we have, to God be the glory, uh, we have finally seen grandchildren. It was, a, it was bad for me. It was a lot worse for grandma. But we have seen the promised land. We saw grandchildren. Two of them were at our house yesterday, and uh, the five-year-old boy, Colin, and I were out playing, and we got a little game we play, and, and, and there was a little bit of a fall to roll in the midst of that game, and I said something, and Grandma told me later, you need to learn, uh, she told me politely, you need to learn to keep your mouth shut. Don't say those kinds of things. Colin's a very sensitive little boy, and I said something, I, I shouldn't have said it, and I, I, it just broke my heart, but, but Colin said something profound to me because he recognized what he had done, and he said, oh, Papa, oh, Papa, I, I've got to learn. My mind tells me to do these things, and I just can't help it. His head tells him to do something, and he does it. I said, well, amen, Colin. I find myself at times doing the same thing. Yes. One great and glorious day, sin will be put off in its totality. It doesn't mean deification. I'm not going to be made into little gods. Nowhere does the scripture say that. It doesn't mean loss of identification. We are who God has made us into. But it does mean transformation more and more into the likeness until finally we are in reality who we are in Christ, redeemed sons and daughters of the King. It's a great and glorious day. But in the meantime, there's this outworking of our salvation. And understand clearly, this outworking of our salvation is not an effort toward being like Jesus so that we can be saved. It is a transformation of character out of salvation, not toward salvation. And we must be absolutely clear about that. We're not trying to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? We're not trying to be like Jesus. So hopefully one day God will say, okay, that you did pretty good. We come and are saved by grace and grace alone through faith and Christ's work alone. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. We're saved by grace, forgiven by grace. If we are saved, it's all of grace. And out of that salvation now comes this transformation. Some of you would like to say sanctification of who we are, and that displays itself more and more into the likeness of Christ. How does that happen? How does it happen? How does Jesus make us more and more into his likeness? Well, I want to explore that very idea out of the book of Philippians, if you'll turn there with us. Please, maybe on your phones, your tablets, matters not to me, as long as you turn to the book of Philippians, chapter number 2, and we'll start there, and then we're going to come back to chapter number 1 and just make a few more points, and we will be done. We're just starting the book today. I would submit to you that the center of the book of Philippians is found in chapter number 2. Um, we know that the book did not originate with chapters and verses. That's not the way Paul wrote it. Those are added simply as a means for us to find our way in the book. Uh, Paul wrote it just simply as this long letter to this church of Philippi. But it does help us to find our way around in the book. And we're going to look at chapter number 2 because I believe it is chapter number 2 that Paul sets the theme. Some people say the theme of the book of Philippians is joy. Paul used the word at least five times in the book of Philippians, and it's true. Joy is a common theme, but I think it's not quite getting at what Paul wrote the book about to simply say the book is about joy. It's much more than that. Chapter number 2. <coughs> Allergies, not COVID. <clears throat> 
So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in His Spirit, any affection and sympathy, remember, as Paul writes this, Paul is writing it not as a question, wondering, is there encouragement in Christ? The grammar is clear. It is intended grammatically to, you could translate it, since there is. Since there is encouragement in Christ. And so don't let the question divert us from the reality of what Paul is saying. Any comfort, any love, any participation in the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, any affection, sympathy, complete by joy by being of the same mind, talking to this body of believers, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or, dis- or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. All of these things, all of these things that Paul begins to unpackage, let each of you not uh, look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. All of these things, we could take a string and trace ultimately back to the very character and essence of who Jesus is and how Jesus lives and how he did live in his incarnation. Because Paul will say, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Conformity, Paul says, conformity, conformity. Be conformed into the likeness of Christ. That's the way, that's God's will, that's God's purpose. That's God's desire, that's God's design. That's what God is after in your life. Paul wants us to be like Christ. He's going to tell us all through the book how that reality comes to be. And that's going to be our journey. But to get to the book, back up to chapter number 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, to get to the book, let's think about the story of the book of Philippians. How How did this message come to be? Where did it come from? How did it originate? Why did Paul write it? To whom did Paul write it? What were the circumstances that drove it? And let's not forget the amazing reality of the person that's writing the book. (laughs) Paul never could get over the reality of who he was. I think Paul woke up every morning just in a bit of shock. Persecuted the church. People like you, he would try to put in prison. People like you, he would applaud when they picked up stones and began to put you to death. And the prisons in which you would go would not be a prison where somebody would be waiting to bail you out. There, there weren't rights. There wasn't a human interest group who was watching out over you. <laughs> Men and women and children, Paul, zealous for God, sought to exterminate, to extinguish the flame of the church. And one day he is on the road to, uh, to continue that service to God in his mind, and God shows up, and Paul, Paul experiences the grace of God, and the gospel becomes transformative for Paul, and Paul goes out in the desert, and the scales fall off his eyes, and he sees things, and he understands things, and Toward the end of his life, he's writing to his dear, dear friend, Timothy. And he can't get over it. He says, chief of sinners. Number one, God showed me grace. Listen, I, I want to be sure you understand one thing as the body of Christ. We must not be silenced. People are saying, uh, silence is complicity today. Hear that phrase to- tossed around a lot. I'm a bit of a snark, and by the grace of God, that's being worked out of my life. I wish it would be faster than it. But I would say to the person that says, silence is complicity, I would say, talk is cheap. They would say, what are you going to say? I would say, what are you going to do? (laughs) But there's a sense in which we must not be silent, and I'm here to tell you, we must not in our day be ashamed of the gospel. Do not let anybody, do not let anybody convince you that the gospel should not be said today. It should be backed out of the conversation. Do you want black people and white people to get along? 
Do you want black people and Hispanic people to get along? Do you want Asian people and white people to get along? Do you want us to talk the same message? Do you want us to love one another? Preach the gospel. It is the answer. It is the one thing, that transformative work of Christ in our lives. You say, that's simplistic. It is, and I understand the complexities. I at least understand some of the complexities, some of the nuances. I get that. I get that. And I understand the need for repentance. I understand the need for change. But ultimately, we must not be ashamed of the gospel. Connie and I sat in a church and, and parish. You sent us. You sent us to see some missionaries It was a life-changing, Connie and I were just talking about how grateful my wife and I, we are to this church for sending us on that trip. It was a life-changer for us. And one of the things that changed us was sitting in this church of 50 or 60 people. I don't think any of them originated from the same country. There were Africans, there were Russians, there were Iraqis, there were some French people, there were three Americans. Uh, They were just, there were British people there. They were from all over the world. And Connie and I talked about how that represents the power of the gospel. It's what the book of Revelation says. People from every tongue and tribe and nation. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. On 51, AD 51, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Dr. Luke left Asia Minor and they head to Europe and they arrive in Macedonia and they go to this little town, this town, this significant town, actually Philippi, and uh, Paul begins to preach the gospel and, and some women believe. What's one of the first women? What's the name of one of the first women to believe? It's dear to my heart. Lydia. Lydia comes to faith in Christ. And a couple of women that would become leaders in the church, and then there would be a falling out, and there would be fussing, and Paul writes and says, Sisters, can't you please get right? There was Clement, who was a significant person. There were these people who believed the gospel, and they become Christians. And Paul uh, sees a church established, which is no small. The first church in Europe is in the city of Philippi. No small feet. And uh, Timothy becomes the darling uh, of the church at Philippi. For some reason, they really love Timothy, and Timothy loves them, and it's a great relationship that he has with them. But Paul and Silas, um, uh, things kind of get rough for them. They get thrown in jail, and while they're in jail, they lead the who to Christ? The jailer. (laughs) Sometimes with the gospel, we just simply need to get out. We have lost confidence in the gospel. We think we have to save people. You can't save a soul. You can't save. Just get out of the way of the gospel. Just give it. It's not your business to save people. Just let the gospel go. Let's get out of the way of the gospel. You say, well, you got to say it exactly right. You got to say it the way Billy Graham said. No, no, you got to say it the way Francis Chan said. No, no, no. You got to say it the way Scott McNeil. Look, look, look. We simply have to, we have to understand what the gospel is. Theologically, we have to be correct. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, God has people who need the gospel. Could be our jailer, could be our doctor, uh, could be our fellow football player, it could be our child. We simply need to give the gospel. Let God do the other business. And so God saves the jailer, honors the faithfulness of Paul. Paul is told by the people of Philippi he needs to go away. The city of Philippi was a difficult place. All the Roman soldiers went there to retire. And Paul shows up and begins to tell them to show their allegiance to King Jesus (laughs) among all these grizzled, retired veterans of the Roman military. Uh, They have no king but Caesar. And Paul says, there is the king whose name is Jesus. He's told to go away. He has the Thessalonica. Three weeks there, he's in difficult straits. Runs into a buzz saw. But the people of Philippi remember Paul, and they keep supporting Paul. Then he heads to Berea, and then Athens, and then to Corinth. Oh, my the city of Corinth, what a mess that was. What a mess. What a mess. <laughs> the church turns into a big mess. But God is faithful. 
And Paul leaves there. And then about a year later, he's going out again. And he's going to go visit some churches. And one of his main purposes, his main purposes is to raise money. And one of his purposes is to raise, along with the priest of gospel, to raise money for starving poor people back in Jerusalem and Judea. And they are a bunch of Jewish Christians. And who's he going to ask that money from? A bunch of what? Gentiles. He's going to go to the black church and say, there's a bunch of white people that need some money. Will you give money? I'm telling you, the the essence of reconciliation is in the gospel. The Jews and the Gentiles hated each other. The Jews looked down on them. What would the Jews say about a Gentile? They're dogs. They're unclean. They're impure. They're outsiders. They start getting saved. They start getting saved. And they're like, what are we supposed to do with these people? Acts chapter number 15. What do we do? How do we, what are we going to do? How do we get along? What do we, what do we do? And, and Paul begins to make clear they understand in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. We are one in Christ. So these Gentile believers are going to seek to help their poor, suffering Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul struggles because some people are preaching the gospel out of poor motivation. He talks about that. Some people are trying to destroy the gospel by adding to it. And Galatia becomes a hotbed of that. It just begins to bubble up. And and Paul is concerned about the people of Philippi because Galatia is not that far. And people of Galatia begin to to be impacted. The Christians by this false gospel that's not really a gospel, Paul would write to them. And he is, in Galatians, challenging them to come back to the faith. But in the book of Philippians, at Philippi, he's worried that This is going to be absorbed by the church of Philippi, and they're beginning to wonder because the pressure is coming. Are they going to abandon Christ? Are they going to forsake Christ? Are Are they going to walk away from Christ? Paul's worried about them. But he's in prison in Rome. He got thrown in jail in Jerusalem. Then he appeals to Caesar. He's sent to Rome, and he's worried about this church. And he can't go. So he wakes up one morning and he says, I can't go to them. I can't Zoom them. I can't FaceTime them. I can't call them. I'll write them. And Paul sits down and he writes a letter because he's so concerned for this church and the brothers and sisters in it. Was Paul aware of what he was doing that here we are all these years later reading Paul's mail, opening up his correspondence? I don't know, but one thing I do know is Paul wrote this. The Spirit of God was inspiring it, and it is evidence that Paul may have been the doctor, but he was not the father of this church. (laughs) He helped deliver the baby, but he didn't give it life. He would tell the Corinthian church, I'm not, I didn't give you life. I didn't die for you. Jesus did. So that when we read the book of Philippians, do not forget what we're reading is this love letter written through Paul, but written from the Lord to these people because ultimately it's God's concern for them. And it's his plan and purpose to transform and make them more like Christ. And it's his call on us today. 
Be like Christ. What does that mean? What does that mean in protest? What does that mean in grief? What does that mean in reconciliation? What does that mean in justice? What does that mean at home? What does that mean in response to your husband? What does that mean in response to your boss? What does that mean as a farmer? What does that mean as a teacher or a healthcare provider? We're going to have to work through some of those issues, but God writes these people because he loves them and he's concerned for them and he longs for them to be more and more like Christ. So he does for us as well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have the Spirit of God in us and he is creating a desire for us to be like Christ. Oh, hunger and a longing to be like Christ. We pray now as we go out of this place and go into the week, and it's still such a strange world. It's still such an unsettling world in which we live. And we pray that we'd be willing to allow the Spirit of God to challenge us and to transform us. It's painful as that may be, to transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ. We pray that you would have the freedom to do that as we yield up our lives to Jesus. We cannot help but say thank you, thank you, thank you for the privilege that was ours to be in this place together with brothers and sisters. What a joy, what a gift. We're grateful. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close? Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise Streams of mercy never cease Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount of fixed upon it Mount of God redeeming love Here I raise my Ebenezer Hither to thy help I go And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to